This video was brought to you by Nebula. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has certainly unified the West. NATO, which was described as brain dead by Macron just a few years ago, has re-established itself as the world's most successful military alliance. The EU, which was widely perceived as an ineffective bureaucracy before the war, has organized unprecedented sanctions and military aid for Ukraine, and has arguably been reinvented as a genuine geopolitical heavyweight. However, not everyone was convinced. Many countries, most notably China, expressed sympathy towards Putin's NATO expansion narrative, and some countries in the global south blamed Western sanctions for the spike in food and fuel prices that followed the invasion. Analysis by the Economist's Intelligence Unit in April 2022 found that two-thirds of the world's population were living in countries that were either neutral or Russia-leaning. Now, this was a massive diplomatic victory for Russia, and it lent legitimacy to Putin's anti-Western narrative. However, in the year or so since Putin invaded, and especially in the last month or so, many of these countries have begun to turn on Russia, and Putin now looks more isolated than ever. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the countries that have recently distanced themselves from Russia, why they've done this, and what this says about Russia's prospects after the war. Hint it's not good news for Putin. So, as we see it, there are at least four countries that have recently distanced themselves from Russia. Serbia, Hungary, India, and Turkey. But on top of that, Russia's relations with the rest of Central Asia are also deteriorating. And pro-Russia opinion in the global south, especially in Africa, is also softening. Anyway, let's start with our list of four, and let's begin with Serbia. Now, we've done a whole video on Serbia's evolving attitude towards Russia before, but the TLDR is that their shared Slavic heritage and mutual dislike of NATO made Serbs pretty pro-Russia. In fact, Serbia's politicians regularly parroted Putin's anti-NATO narrative, and the Serbian government refused to join in with the EU sanction regime instead signing a lucrative gas deal with Russia's Gazprom. Unfortunately for Putin, though, Serbia has since changed its tune. In January, Serbia's president told Bloomberg that he couldn't support Putin's invasion, and that Crimea is Ukraine, Donbass is Ukraine. Now, while the president has still refused to join in with EU sanctions, he has reiterated his intention to eventually join the bloc, insisting that the EU is Serbia's path, there are no other paths. Now, this U-turn is presumably both because they genuinely realise that the EU is Serbia's only viable option. Serbia did 10 times as much trade with the EU as they did with Russia in 2021, and because Russia has proved itself to not be a reliable security partner. Another country that's distanced itself from Russia recently is Turkey. Now, like Serbia, Turkey previously refused to join in with Western sanctions, instead taking the opportunity to receive copious amounts of Russian money and oil in order to bolster their floundering economy. However, in early March, Turkey suddenly announced that they would be observing Western sanctions on goods going to Russia. Now, no one's quite sure why Turkey suddenly changed tack. And it's important to stress that Turkey definitely isn't fully on board with the West yet. After all, Erdogan is still stubbornly blocking Sweden's accession into NATO. But this sudden change, for whatever reason, isn't a good sign for Putin. And at roughly the same time, India suddenly announced that they would also be abiding with the G7's oil price cap. Like Turkey, India had previously ignored the West sanctions, instead taking the opportunity to stock up on cheap Russian oil. And as a result, when the price cap was first announced, India basically just said they would ignore it. Now, like Turkey, it's unclear why India suddenly changed their tune. But India's foreign minister did hold discussions with their Western counterparts at the February G20 meeting. And it might also be related to a recent report that Russia has been unable to fulfill its arms delivery commitments because of Ukraine. But either way, it's another bad sign for Putin. 
The last country worth noting on our list here, though, is Hungary. And that's because Hungary has consistently diluted EU sanctions. And Hungary's Viktor Orban has spent the time since the invasion criticizing the West and George Soros more specifically for their apparent hawkishness. However, earlier this month, Orban apparently U-turned. Having argued that Europe needed to maintain relations with Russia just a few weeks earlier, on March 9th, Orban told an economic forum in Budapest that Hungary would have to think hard about its future relations with Russia. Now, this apparent U-turn is almost definitely related to the ongoing discussions between Hungary and the EU over 30 billion euros worth of EU funds that have been withheld over concerns about Hungary's attitude towards the rule of law and LGBTQ rights. And the timing of this does seem to line up, because a few weeks after Orban's change of tone, Hungary told Bloomberg that a deal with the EU was nearly finalised. But even if this is as transactional as it appears, it's still bad news for Putin. And on top of those four countries, each of which are pretty influential in their own right, almost all of Central Asia has fallen out with Russia, either because they're worried that they might end up being the next victim of Putin's neo-Soviet ambitions, as is the case with Kazakhstan, or because they've lost faith in Russia's ability to be an effective security partner, as is the case with Armenia. The Global South have also become less pro-Russia over time, both because the West has stepped up their diplomatic efforts in the region, and because, as global food prices and oil prices have once again fallen, the Global South are now more worried about Putin's nuclear saber-rattling than the West's sanctions. Now, that doesn't mean that Russia is totally isolated just yet. Russia does still have a few notable allies, including Belarus, China, and Iran. But even here, things aren't quite so clear-cut. While Belarus might have agreed to station nukes on their territory, Lukashenko has stubbornly refused to open up a northern front against Ukraine. Similarly, while China might be sympathetic towards Russia's plight, Xi has refused to provide military aid, in part because China wants to maintain good relations with the EU. All in all, while there are a variety of reasons why individual countries are distancing themselves from Russia, the fundamental reason is that, well, no one likes a loser. And that might sound like a cheap partisan shot at the Kremlin, but it's a basic truth of geopolitics that many countries just side with whoever they think is winning. And many of these countries have distanced themselves from Russia because they no longer believe that Russia will be an effective military or economic partner in the future. And in many cases, they apparently now think that the EU is a much better bet. Obviously, it goes without saying that this is bad news for Russia. Not just because being an international pariah is, well, bad, but also because political isolation breeds political isolation. As Russia loses allies, its geopolitical clout wanes further, which means that it's an even less appealing partner, accelerating this downwards trend. If that's not enough TLDR for you for one day, then you ought to check out our new series, This Week in Parliament, which has just made a magnificent return. That's not a quote or anything, that's just a thing I'm saying. Anyway, This Week in Parliament is a show where we run down exactly what happened in Parliament in the preceding week, breaking down the debates, laws and bills which otherwise you'd have totally missed, and explaining what really happens in Britain's seats of power when you brush aside all of the shouting and arm-waving. New episodes of that come out every week only on Nebula. But that's not all. There's also the extended version of the daily briefing every single weekday, a bunch of exclusive explainer videos, some totally silly fun content, and all of our videos totally ad-free. And it's not just TLDR either. We're joined by a whole bunch of your favorite creators, from Wendover and Real Life Law to Johnny Harris. Which means that on Nebula, there's a whole ton of exclusive videos, early access to loads of creators, and all of the ad-free viewing you could possibly handle. And signing up using our link gets you access for just $2.50 a month. Not only that, this is the absolute best way you can support the channel. So thanks for watching and we'll see you soon on Nebula.